Hello, mountain bike friends. This is Jeff and Jared. And we are here with episode 81 of the MTB podcast presented and hosted by Worldwide Cyclery. This episode's topics will be a couple funny stories from myself and Jared. And we will also go over SRAM GX Access, Pirelli Tires, Shimano's Anti-Counterfeiting Program, Problems with Mountain Bikes, the side from the cost and service intervals, uh, March 2021's trending mountain bike products, tires that are not Maxxis, and listener questions around brake problems and Fox suspension. Mm -hmm. Action packed. I like it. Action packed. Action packed. Strap your seatbelt in. Seatbelts. That didn't make any sense. DJ Pineapple. Run a sound effect. Stories. 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 All right. Mine revolves around the 4x4x48. What is the 4x4x48? It is a challenge presented by this guy, David Goggins. Uh, If you don't know, you should know. The one and only. The one and only. Legendary. Google him. Legendary. Yeah, so his his whole thing um, is four miles every four hours for 48 hours. A lot of people do it running. I think that's how it originally was, but people do it of all various different types and ways. And the whole thing is about uh, challenging yourself mentally and physically and also raising money for charity. And so David Goggins promotes it. It happens once a year. And I decided to do a through hike version. I guess you could call it that. So it's just a point to point 48 mile hike. Um, so I covered four miles every four hours for 48 hours <sighs> through the Santa Monica Mountains. 20,000 feet of elevation gain and loss. Brutal. Uh, My feet were toasted. Ended up doing just over 51 miles because of a mapping error. Never really planned out a hike that far, so I made a mapping error. Reasonable. Um, It was good. It was fun. I mean, we raised over over $5,000, $5,500. Awesome. Various different peoples, various different charities basically took pledges. Thank you for reminding me of my pledge, by the way. Yeah, what was your pledge? Um, I believe it was like $40 to Ventura County Animal Shelters. Ah, nice. Did you make it? I need to. I forgot. You better do that, man. You just reminded me. I followed up with all my big (laughs) pledges, but if you were under 50 bucks, I didn't follow up and hound you down. Well, you just did. Perfect. We were followed up. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a good time. It was uh, er- early in the month of March, and I had a great time other than my feet exploding. It was really fun. Uh, Dominic on our crew also did it. He did like a multi-sport version of it out in and around Reno, Nevada, where he lives. And then uh, Tyler on our crew did it too. He did some running. He did some riding, a little multi-sport variation. Mm-hmm. We documented the whole thing on the Kettle Mountain Instagram And if you want to check that out, go to the Kettle Mountain Instagram. It's a story highlight on there. You can recap it. It was a good time. It was good fun. It was was a mental and physical challenge because I think we slept two hours the first night and three hours the second night. Um, Just, you know, a lot of just sitting in the dirt. And, yeah, it was a good good time. I enjoyed it. It's a major challenge. Don't know a lot of other people that would attempt that. Yeah, that one was fun. I mean, I was thinking about doing, like, a mountain bike version of it, but it had been kind of too easy. Four miles on a mountain bike every four hours or 48 hours, like, yeah, I, I feel like you have seemed to easier than up the, the numbers, hike version. You know, like, yeah, you have to like yeah. eight by eight, right? Ooh, that would be or harder. eight by four. Maybe we should host one of those, like a mountain bike challenge. That'd be cool. Yeah, but I don't think that many people would do it because even this one, I asked about I don't know a hundred people if they wanted to do it with me or their own version of it, and just about nobody said yes. That's, that's far. What is that like? Basically, two marathons like worth in two days. Yeah, I mean that's definitely. Challenging. It's, a, it's a challenge. Not it's a lot a of people I know like that can though. handle that. For a good cause. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's a great cause. So that's my story. It doesn't have to do with mountain bikes, but I, I definitely also really enjoy hiking and a few other uh, sports. I don't know if hiking is considered a sport, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> activities. I, I enjoy other activities than just mountain biking. So yeah. um, that's what I did for that one. Yeah. What is your story, Jared? Well, a couple of wildlife encounters lately. Um, most recently I was out for a ride in Sycamore Canyon, pretty mm-hmm. close to our shop out here in Newbury Park. And it's about an hour Northwest of LA ish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're about to climb out, like finishing the ride and pretty out of it, but like just saw this, like at least three foot rattlesnake across, just stretching across the road and stemmed on Paved like, road or dirt road? Oh, paved road. Okay. Yeah. It's the paved road. Like, uh, right before you're basically going up the blacktop hill yeah. and, um, stopped and it started rattling and then basically watched this thing go up like a near vertical slope i've never seen a snake go up a steep hill it yeah, was that is like kind of unnerving it was very unnerving 
and it was yeah very crazy to see and then a couple weeks prior i basically um was going down a single track and i was chasing a coyote basically like i just came around a turn and there was a coyote chasing like going down the trail in front of me and then i got to the bottom of the trail and the coyote was maybe 30 feet away from me and we we're just staring each other down like we're both just standing there direct eye contact stare down stare down and then uh you know he started to creep towards me a little bit and i just picked my bike up over my head and like kind of went after him. What do you think bit. he was gonna do? It's a coyote. I know, but he was They're looking like at me because small mangy I, dogs. I know, but I figured if I just kind of like kept on, like if I turned around and I kept going, that he would have chased after me. Yeah. So I was like, I'm gonna scare the crap out of this guy. So I picked my bike up over my head and I started yelling like a madman, <laughs> <laughs> and I ran after the coyote. And he was like, Okay, screw that. I am out of here. So my plan worked out great. That's I was, pretty cool. Both encounters, I was safe from the wildlife. Yeah. So that was great. Yeah, wildlife encounters are fun when you're out on the trail. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, it just adds a little flavor to any mountain bike ride. Oh, yeah. That's for sure. It, it was definitely exciting both times. Yeah, I remember. So when we did this 4x4x48, four by four by so 51 miles through Santa Monica Mountains, a lot of it was at nighttime. Mm -hmm. We didn't see any animals. What? We literally saw one bunny and one squirrel. That is insane. Swear I'm out. I couldn't believe it. That's it's crazy. That, a lot of the night hiking, we thought we heard animals, but we didn't even see deer. It's like every time you go into Sycamore, you see a bunch of animals. Yeah. And that's like, that's super surprising wow, that you didn't see a lot of animals. animals in SoCal, man. There's not that much water here. Yeah, that's true. It's more fish in the ocean. Yeah. That's what we got. Fish and <laughs> cactus. <laughs> that's great. I, fi I figured at least you would have seen a bunch of creatures like in the middle of the night. Like, yeah, no. you know, like when we go on night rides, you know, we see like toads and oh yeah there's a lot of birds that like fly up and down and stuff yeah, yeah you and i were on a night ride we saw it was that big toad remember yeah big old desert toad <laughs> <laughs> that was cool all right they those are cool. those are our story recaps yeah. let's get in some products they were cool i've brought to market two bicycle bidets to soothe your hole squirt 1.0 and squirt mini squirt 1.0 is a fully electronic three-cylinder eight horsepower dingleberry blasting machine Squirt Mini takes all the engineering of Squirt 1.0, but easy and conveniently screws on to your water bottle for trail side relief. Pick up your Squirt 1.0 for $49.99 and your Squirt Mini for $29.99. Or for a limited time only, get both the 1.0 and the Mini for 14 easy payments of $9.99. You do the math. Visit SquirtDingleberryBlaster.com. Bye. My name is Billy. So this month, March, this is probably podcast going to go live in April, but we're recording it on the last day of March. So March 25th, SRAM released, announced, let out of the cage, mm -hmm. electronic mountain bike shifting for only $600. Highly anticipated release. Highly anticipated. Yeah. So it's their GX version of Access, A-X-S, pronounced Access. Access. Um yeah wow i mean very cool we've we've both ridden the x01 and xx1 access mm -hmm. pretty extensively mm -hmm. eagle i guess we forgot the word eagle yeah don't forget the word eagle eagle um eagle access yeah it's cool it's it's really nice i mean it's it's very fancy and it's, it was just cool to see electronic mountain bike shifting come to a different price point so that 600 dollars is basically gets you your it's an upgrade kit mm -hmm. so derailleur controller mm -hmm. which is the shifter but yep. they call it a controller is it just called a controller because it's electric it still shifts the gears why don't they just call it a shifter because it's electronic and like you know it's like you're playing a video game with your controller it's like you're controlling the like derailleur it's a controller remote control for your tv because yeah, it's electric exactly yeah, yeah i okay, mean it still, shifts, the controller. It still shifts gears yeah, i shifts don't know gears. i think you should call it a shifter but uh, i'm i'm in the minority clearly because it's called a controller yeah. so the 600 dollars gets you the derailleur the controller yep the battery battery charger right yep doesn't this all come with this and and, and your little b tension tool yep yep the tool um, does it come with that cool new little housing cover for it? What do they call that? Uh, the What's battery that cover. The battery cover. Isn't there it, a fancy little I name for it? I do not believe it comes with the battery cover. It does. It Someone's does come with the battery. We're getting some external information that it external does come with the battery cover. The battery cover. Yes. The picture shows that. So. The picture uh -huh. does. And it is also available as a accessory for other access kits. Yeah, if you want a battery cover yes. for your for your current it looks pretty cool. Kit. Yeah, it's a nice know. little, nice little tricky add-on. If you have any problems bashing your battery into stuff, yeah, that wasn't pretty cool. Much of a problem I'd ever heard of, but yeah. I guess it is. Maybe for so, some. 
Maybe for some. Maybe for some. Um, we made a YouTube video about it, and uh, it was one of the more fun ones we did. I think Jared and I are going to try and do more of these comedy, like Anchorman style news skits. So if you didn't see our video, our YouTube video on SRAM Eagle GX Access, please watch it. We're very proud of it. Very proud. There's a lot of like funny bike industry jokes in there. The first minute and a half is just this like Anchorman style news skit that's hilarious. And the second half of it is just like actual detailed inform informative product stuff. Um, but it was fun. It was very fun. We got to wear suits. We uh, got to basically play Anchorman. Yeah. It was cool. I love doing those. Yeah. I would, I'll do one for every product release. Yeah. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think we should do it more. <laughs> They're awesome. I love doing um, those. But yeah, so I mean, so far, so we basically sold out. We were only able to secure inventory wise uh, just less than 30 of those kits and we sold out in less than a couple hours, Yeah, which was crazy. And uh, yeah, we have a bunch more in order. They'll be trickling in. We do have them available for uh, what we call special order, which is kind of like a back order or pre-order. Basically, mm -hmm. you can like pre purchase it and then mm -hmm. put yourself in line so when we do get the inventory we can ship it out but yeah the mountain bike industry is still which is probably sounding like a sounding like a broken record now it's just in an inventory pinch mm -hmm. um and so yeah inventory is hard to come by whether that's bikes or components or anything and gx access was a major hit and yeah i think everybody everybody sold out oh yeah um, really quickly definitely but it's it'll more will come um and yep. it's cool I mean, if you want to upgrade your shifting so basically the gx access works on any and all existing eagle drivetrains which is which is rad i think that was why they called it access right like it's accessible to all the eagle drivetrains oh did i just make that up i think you maybe have yeah i thought i heard that yeah <laughs> that's not confirmed uh, SRAM maybe can confirm or deny that, but awaiting response from SRAM on if that is why yeah. they call it Axis. Um, but it's all cross compatible. I mean, that's one of the cool things about Eagle. Yeah, Eagle was like completely everything was cross compatible until they introduced the fifty two tooth. Then there was some like, would it be called forward or backwards compatibility? Backwards issues? compatible, like if the yeah, new... so like the fifty two yeah. tooth cassette wouldn't necessarily work with a derailleur that wasn't made for the 52 tooth right. specifically. But the new derailleurs are backwards all compatible. The, all the new ones the that are made 50, for right. 52 tooth works with that cassette exactly. and the 50 tooth cassette too. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So if you have SRAM Eagle on your bike and you're looking for an electronic upgrade yeah. um, and your price points 600 rather than 1,000, GX yeah. access. And it's only, what is it, maybe 75 grams heavier than... Yeah, uh, yeah, because I, I, I addressed that in the everything. video. It, yeah. it was, you know, because I'm sure people are wondering, like, well, what's the difference? Like, yeah. Why is it $400 cheaper? Yeah. And like most things in the mountain bike industry, when the price point lowers, the it's usually just materials. It's yeah. almost, sometimes they, like, you starve off some features in there to change the price point. But no, this in this case, like, the features are the same. The batteries last the same. The, mm -hmm. the derailleur lasts about 20 hours worth of riding. Mm -hmm. The controller lasts about two years. There's just a coin cell battery in there. Mm -hmm. um, performance it, is also great. Performance Similar. is flawless. Yeah, yeah so it's I mean, it's, it's just slightly heavier yeah. than the XO1 stuff. a steel cage, right, on yeah. the GX, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah, just a little bit different materials, which adds a little weight, and that's it. And it's... 400 bucks less. Yeah. So I dig it. Yeah. It's cool. It's just cool to see electronic shifting becoming a thing. And yeah, it's, it's, it's fancy. It's interesting. It's, it's easier to install than having cables. And oh, I yeah. don't know. It's a cool, fun toy. That's for sure. Mountain Super bikers easy. are inherently gadget wizards and they, yeah. they love, <laughs> they love stuff like that. Us included. So totally. yeah. Yeah. Cool to see. Um, yeah. Check it out. SRAM GX Eagle access 600 bucks for the upgrade kit. Mm -hmm. um, the other th quick product thing I wanted to discuss real fast was Pirelli top Tires. Sweet. So we're going to mention uh, later in the video about uh, later in the video. I keep saying video. It's yeah. a podcast. Well, it's technically later a video in, too. Oh, it is a video. It's a video and a podcast. It's yeah. on the MTB podcast YouTube channel if you want to watch it. That was a perfect segue. Right. What do you know? Um, later in the podcast, we'll mention uh, just a quick overview of a video we recently did on YouTube called Tires Not Maxis, which we kind of talked about like all the various popular tire brands that are not Maxis, since Maxis is kind of like the dominant player in the field in North America. But one of them that we forgot to mention, which was a total oversight, um, was Pirelli. And Pirelli is, well, Pirelli, I don't know how long they've even been making mountain bike tires. Yeah. It's an Italian brand, isn't it? It's got to be an Italian brand. I believe so. I mean, but, it's, it's, not know, a, it's not from North America, yeah. that's for sure. But um, Pirelli is, is probably one of the 
the tire brands that I'm actually really excited about just on as far as like specs, like what those tires look like and their widths and their weights and everything. Mm. And they just have a long time history of making some of the best motocross tires ever. So I just have a, a lot of faith that their mountain bike and gravel tires are going to be really good. Oh, yeah. Um, and they've never really made it. They've never made a splash in North America because they've just they just haven't, you yeah. know, they've never really been a- available per se in a yeah. good way, but they have, the brand has now their, their mountain bike and gravel tires have been picked up by QBP. QBP quality bicycle products is a, is a uh, kind of behind the scenes wholesale distributor that works with on a wholesale level, all of the bicycle stores, all the bicycle retailers in all of North America. Um, they're the huge, big dominant player there. So basically now that Pirelli is at QBP, Every bike shop in the whole country and Canada should essentially have access to Pirelli tires as soon as they all start coming into stock. So that's something I'm really excited about. Um, I just trust their motocross tire reputation, and I mm-hmm. think they're going to make some really good stuff. So yeah. if you're interested in trying some new tires um, in the next couple months here, there should be some Pirelli tire availability hopefully, Sweet. Um, across the board with some really good models. I mean, I've already got some of their gravel tires on, on item watch. So I can order those when those show up. Nice. I don't know if I'm like, I'm, I'll probably will try some of their mountain bike tires, but yeah. I got to dig in a little Why deeper not? to the specs and compare them to some of my favorite Maxxis combos. Why not? You never they know until have, you try. They don't have a big yellow logo on the side. That's there convenient. There you go. Which is surprising because I'm pretty sure their logo is, does have yellow in yeah, it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. I remember I, I was talking to guys at Maxxis about that a long time ago and the whole concept was like, Max is coming to the U.S. market, and there was, like, Goodyear and Dunlop, and this is, like, the NASCAR market, and those, like, mm-hmm. big yellow tire logos were the thing, and they've kind of just made their way. And even if you're watching this video, there's a, there's Max's tire, <laughs> but <laughs> it's got a logo. white logo. So I mentioned this in some Max's tire video, but the white logos for Max's are OE only, right? So, like, mm-hmm. if they come with the complete bike you purchased, you can get a white logo that says Max's. But if you buy a Max's tire aftermarket, the logo is yellow. Which one do you like better? Oh, dude, the white. Yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on the bike. Yeah. I mean, ironically, this bike we're talking about, it's got some yellow accents. So I know. like the yellow logo <laughs> might look it okay. It would look perfect on this bike. Um, but in like a lot of bikes, the yellow Maxxis logo just really stands out as like a clashy color because yeah. I don't know. I don't yeah. know why they don't just make it gray. Like WTB, they I make gray the, yeah, it logos. Looks amazing. It looks super nice. Especially it's, on a, like a more subdued you know, color scheme bike. It's yep. like you maybe don't want a yellow hot patch on your tire. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, I've I've told Maxis that a thousand times. They refused to listen to me. They didn't listen. They did listen. They didn't listen. Um, all right. Well, let's jump into an ad, and then we'll discuss our next thing. All right. And now, a word from our sponsors. Do you poop a lot? Do you ride bikes a lot? Do you have to poop while riding bikes a lot? If you answered yes to two of these questions, then j reusable toilet paper is for you. Our state-of-the-art steel wool infused toilet paper will leave you feeling clean and refreshed. Stock up now at j reusable toilet paper.org. And now, back to the show. Shimano's anti-counterfeit program. So this is kind of an interesting topic that I wanted to include in the podcast just because it's it's near and dear to my heart as <laughs> as a longtime bicycle industry person and and it's pretty interesting. So uh, Shimano, you know, they came out with a quote here that was quoted in Bicycle Retailer just basically saying in recent years we have confirmed that counterfeit goods of Shimano Group products and repair parts have been circulating around the world blah 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 blah. Uh that to me kind of just makes me go duh. Um, I don't know how to really put it any nicer than that, but yeah, mm-hmm. yeah it's, it's interesting. I mean, you can, I mean, just like anything, but it's seemingly Shimano is, is really all over there. You can go on things like AliExpress, Alibaba, even eBay and buy counterfeit Shimano product. And it's just fake. Mm-hmm. And it may have come, I mean, who knows where it came from? Did it come from the same factory after hours with no serial number? Did it come from like an OE, like a, a bike brand who actually is genuine product, but it's not meant for the aftermarket. So then you can't warranty it, but it's really cheap. Shimano has got a lot of supply chain problems that really kind of gives them a bad reputation in the bike industry. Um, so it was just cool to cool to see this. And it's an interesting thing to highlight because as a, as a listener to this podcast, you have probably bought Shimano products like we all have as mountain bikers and uh, yeah, where you buy it how much it costs and if it has a real warranty and it's a legitimate product is, is pretty important. So 
I don't know. It was just an interesting, interesting thing to talk about because, um, yeah, I mean, you got to be safe with that stuff. You can't be buying counterfeit products. And it's kind of, it's, it's too easy to buy fake Shimano stuff. What, oh, did, yeah. what did you find? I mean, well, I found a uh, fully XTR equipped, you know, bike here on AliExpress for $50. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. But I mean, I've had people reach out to us through the worldwide email asking if our Shimano stuff is um, authentic or not. You That's know? kind of good. At least people, that yeah. means that they know that there is a problem with non-authentic Shimano product. You know, or like, or that they've had an experience where they've ordered it off yeah. a website that seems legit and they've gotten something that's clearly not, Yep. which is like, wow. I mean, even if you go on AliExpress, like you could look at like, if you search like a Fox fork, it's clearly not a Fox fork. Yeah. But if you're ordering something like Shimano, I don't know, derailleur or shifter, like you might not know. I mean, on a regular website or something, right? Like yep. it's probably a little bit easier to counterfeit Definitely. just a shifter or something like that. But you're right. It's like it poses the question, was this actually made in the factory like after hours or yeah. like, and, and just doesn't have serial number or is this exactly? You know, yeah. Or it could, it could be off. legitimate and it could be, you know, uh, you know, OE product that's not meant for aftermarket sale. Yeah. Um, it could be completely counterfeit, which poses a really big issue. Yeah. Um, which is, I mean, crazy to think about. Just, yeah, it is. Know. It is totally. So, I mean, that's, that's just a problem. So, I mean, that's just one of those things that's like buy your product from good, real legitimate retailers. Yeah, basically. Exactly. Um, even, even if it's a matter of like, Oh, I could get it here for $20 cheaper. It's, <laughs> You'll get what you pay for typically. Yeah. But it's, it, to me, it's like surprising to see Shimano make sort of this public announcement about this, like, and address the problem, which yeah. I respect and say that they're going to now launch this whole program to prevent counterfeiting. Um, and they're modifying their packaging with QR codes and various things to make sure that, you know, you can confirm if the Shimano product you bought is legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's really cool. I, I like I like the fact that that is coming about because I think that problem is more pervasive with Shimano than any other brand in the industry. Yeah, and it doesn't seem like they've done much to address it, but now they they're definitely doing something to address it. Yeah, so it's cool. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I mean, I I was surprised, you know, even just in the last few years, the amount of people I've heard of, whether it's just like friends or people out on rides that are buying these uh, frames. The on, Chinese frames. The Chinese frames. It blows me away. Like full carbon, like mountain bike frames. Yeah. Full suspension or hardtails for like 300 bucks. Yeah, I, it's just, I would... Personally, and it's usually from Alibaba, AliExpress, whatever. Yeah, it's like I, just, I would never no, touch that. You're you're, so you're trusting your, your life yeah. on a, a Chinese yeah carbon frame when it's you're trusting like, your family jewels because when that head tube snaps <laughs> and you're you all of a sudden yeah yeah that's oh my just, gosh oh. it's just that's like yeah beyond me I would pay more for a lower quality frame if that's what it meant for me to be yeah. safe. You know, it's like. You're asking for it almost. Yeah, I agree. But so yeah, I, don't know. I understand if that's like what's in the budget or whatever. Yeah. But like, you know, I would definitely, like I said, go for something maybe a little bit lower tier, like just an aluminum frame, like cheap yeah, aluminum frame. Totally. Versus being like, I got the carbon frame, but it was three hundred dollars on Ali, and I might break it. Yeah. I might die. Oh, I know. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, it's it's a, it's a touchy subject because there's obviously a lot of biased opinions on either side of the table, and then there's people who argue that they're the exact same things yeah. from the same factory, and sure. then. There's, you know, the certain people in the bike industry, of course, have a very different perspective on the whole thing. But a lot of the times, like consumers will look at that as like, oh, you're just biased because you're trying to sell me whatever you have. You know, it's like, yeah. so I don't know. It's, there's just a lot of shenanigans on that whole topic. But yeah. when you see like a big public release of like Shimano launches global anti-counterfeiting program, <laughs> like there's clearly yeah, a problem. There's there. a problem here. Like yeah. we're not just making it up because we want to sell you our Shimano stuff for more expensive. Like we're just... Kindly letting you know you might be buying a counterfeit product. Yeah, that's crazy. So, I don't know. Interesting stuff. Definitely. Um, slightly rolls into the next topic, which Jared and I were, uh, I would say, bickering about prior to recording, which is <laughs> problems with mountain bikes aside from cost and service intervals. Because if you look at like, okay, the modern day high end seven ten thousand dollar mountain bike. Mm -hmm. Um, what are, and we're not talking e-bikes, e-bikes are in a different category here because they probably have some other problems that we're not that familiar with because we don't ride e-bikes enough. Um, but your seven to $10,000 high end full suspension mountain bike, what, what problems exist that 
aren't, you know, obviously you can always say like, oh, I want the same quality for less. Duh. You can say, I want things to be service less. Like you just want your suspension to last 500 hours or mm -hmm. your drivetrain to last 6,000 miles mm -hmm. or your chain to not have to be lubed every ride. Like, yes. Yeah. You know, those are all kind of table stakes. So like the reason this topic got brought up is because there was something in popular science and a few other outlets talking about these, these new wild airless tires and from some startup with some like NASA space technology, like, I don't know. We didn't look too much into it. It, it was it was very it was something about the Mars rover tires, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a similar in design to yeah. those because obviously you cannot. But I think the prototype they made was on a road bike, right? Right. Yep. Exactly. So, they call so, it the metal tire, M E T L. Yeah. So our thought was like, ah, oh, it's never. I mean, who knows how long I could take to be affordable or show up on mountain bikes and yada yada. But anyways, I my my comment was. That's kind of the only problem left. Like, good modern day mountain bike works so good. Mm -hmm. Like, you get the occasional flat tire, and Jared's argument was like, that almost never happens. And if it does, it's your fault because you like smashed on some rock and you didn't have enough PSI. <laughs> you didn't check your tire pressure. Yeah, and that's, that's the one time that's right? valid. Like, you yeah. don't check your tire pressure, you got for a ride, you get a flat. Yeah, um, that's valid. But I mean, it's, yeah. I don't know. There's, to me, that's still like, I mean, yes, it doesn't happen often. I don't get flat tires on my mountain bike very often. No, but you're right. Like, hypothetically, you could get a brand new tire and you could go for a ride. You get yep. one ride on it and you get a flat and then even if it's bad enough you're screwed you got to get a new new tire yeah if you're running tubeless or whatever even if you have a tube in there you probably need a new tire um but yeah you're right that is hypothetically a problem you know a design problem that like we could hypothetically fix it is yeah because i mean flat tires are still just an issue yeah um and i and like Mountain bikes are one thing, right? Mountain bikes are usually getting a flat tire because you tear a sidewall or you puncture it or snake bite it um thorn Thor yeah, well, so thorns, that's what I'm going to mention. So, like, thorns aren't as common on mountain bikes because you're riding on, like, mountain bike trails, right? At least, you know, like, here where you don't really have issues. Yeah, thorns are more of, like, a non-native plant species from what I remember. Um, but you usually get them on, like, the side of the road. You don't, like, get them out on mountain bike yeah. trails. Um, or cacti. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, Arizona, you have to, you have to mess that one you up. You cacti out here, you too. Have to, you have to go off the trail by mistake. Yeah, It's not like it's just on the trail maybe. usually. Yeah, I I've guess seen it depends them on the trail. What, <laughs> it depends on what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think that's that's kind of the only problem left, you yeah. know? I mean, you could argue that brakes could be more powerful. Or uh, that, like, maybe... Consistent? Like, yeah, consistency is the probably the main thing. Brakes like, aren't perfect, With that's hydraulic for sure. or any kind of brake. No I mean, brakes are perfect, yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you obviously have to bleed your brakes. Like, you got to make sure your rotors are aligned and your brake pads. Yeah, brake like, rubbing. That's a... Pain. That still exists. It's still, I mean, yeah. you got to put in a lot of effort, and you have to be really well versed as a mechanic to understand how to get rotors not to rub. You could get a brand new rotor out of the package and still have it rub. Oh, well, they never come perfectly straight. You yeah. Gotta, oh, that's supposed to, you're supposed to do that yourself. Yeah. But it doesn't say that on the package. <laughs> <laughs> so people get mad. I don't know. I, Please bend the rotor with your hands I think, to make it perfect. Yeah, yeah, it seems like it seems to me like brakes and tires are probably like the. The, those are the two things that I would like start nitpicking at. I mean, yeah. they're not honestly not bad. Yeah. You know, if you know what you're doing, you're a proper mechanic, you know how to work on your stuff. It's not bad. Right. Um, but if neglected. But, yeah, exactly. If neglected, you got an issue. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I think, man, I think those are the only really two problems left. I mm -hmm. mean, they've kind of solved the dropper post unreliability issue. Yeah. The gear range depending issue. On front what trailers post you are have. dead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, depending on what post you have. True. <laughs> Um, you know, this is, this is like, we're talking high end mountain bikes, yeah. right? Like yeah. uh, again, cause we're trying to avoid this whole conversation. We're trying to avoid the cost and the service intervals thing. Cause like the cost thing you could be like, well, I want a reliable dropper post. And it's like, well, that exists, but it might be totally out of your budget. Yeah. Um, so it's, they don't make reliable dropper posts under like 200 bucks. Yeah. I made 150. I don't know. So, I mean, there's, yeah, there's still that problem, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Bikes are pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, they really yeah. are. I mean, much better than they were 10 years ago, like you said yeah, earlier. Yeah, that was the thing we were talking about. Because, I mean, if you rode mountain bikes, if, if you're listening to this and you're a longtime mountain biker, you remember 10, 15 years ago, there was, like, an infinite amount of problems. Yeah. Suspension was not progressive enough. <laughs> whether like you realized it or sticked. not. Yeah, whether you realized yeah. it or not. I mean, you're still having fun. Yeah. But, like, your suspension was basically a pogo stick because you either had enough pressure so it wouldn't bottom out, and then it was, like... Or not bobbing a ton. Yeah, like, yeah, you had bobbing issues. Oh. You had suspension, had no progressivity to it and no, like, proper adjustment to it. Um, you had front trailers. Yeah. Which was horrendous. And geometry. You didn't have narrow-wide chain rings. Ugh. You didn't have a dropper post. Ugh. 
I mean, there was so many problems back then. I know. Your brakes were horrible. But we just like learned and lived you had quick to release, deal with it. Quick release you know? hubs. That's just like, that's just flex that's out just the what wazoo. We did. It's just, yeah. that's just like what we knew. You improvised. Yeah. Cause that's, that's all there was. Yeah. Yeah. So it is, it is really cool. I mean, of uh, that's something I love about the mountain bike industry is there's always innovation and creativity going on and problem solving. And like, yes, it comes at a cost. Like yeah. things are not cheap. Like a high end mountain bike is an expensive device mm-hmm. and you'll never hear the end of people being like, that's the same price as a motorcycle. <laughs> yes. No, we understand. It's the same. I could get two cars for the price of that new specialized e-bike. Like, yeah, <laughs> Yeah, no, I I got it. Like, we get it. Um, the stuff is expensive because there's not that many people that are in the scheme of things. You know, you know, there's so many cars out there and motorcycles and mountain yeah. bikes are just a smaller, smaller niche. So the the scale of manufacturing doesn't quite get that big yet. Yeah, but I mean, you're paying for the development. You're right? paying a and ton for R and for D. Yeah, and the, and just the fact that like you know none of these high end bikes are really made at like a serious scale. Yeah. Like look look at the amount of iPhones Apple makes versus the amount of like SB one fifties that Yeti makes. It's a quite a big difference in the number there. Oh, yeah. So huge. So yeah, you're you're gonna pay for that. Um, but yeah, anyways, I mean bikes are pretty cool. So yeah. random right. topic, but something that we've been thinking about because. I don't know. We we look at that, forecast that for our industry because there's always different things in the industry that cause sort of economic activity per se. Mm-hmm. You know, 27 five inch wheels, 29 inch wheels, dropper posts, one by 12 drive trains, one by 11 drive trains. There's always like various things that sort of cause these like cause economic activity. That's like, oh, this is latest and greatest, and it's actually significantly better rather than negligibly better. Yeah. And that's usually what gets people to pull out their wallet and be like, bam, I want that. Mm-hmm. You know, and and I'm. I'm always kind of talking about this product innovation plateau. Like I, I worry about that for the bike industry because I mean, as much as SRAM Eagle GX access is amazing, the upgrade level there is like arguably negligible. Mm. I mean, you love it, right? Like you're just like, dude, it's just, it's just amazing. Well, access, like, dude, it's yeah, just it good. All right. Amazing. Yeah. But okay. But one thing you can't do bike with already shifts good. mechanical shifter is just hold it down and it keeps shifting. Like, True. You know, there's, so you have to push your thumb a couple more things. times. That's pretty substantial. Well, and it goes way faster. Or is faster. that pretty negligible? It goes way faster. Okay, faster shifting. Then you I've could never complain about slow shifting, have you? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool, but it's uh, something are, you didn't know you needed. These are funny things to discuss, yeah, right? it's something you didn't know you needed until it came out. Like, oh my gosh. I Once you try it, it's like, well, now you have That's it in the true. back of your head. Like, I well, agree. if I had access. Yeah, I mean, if you ride a SRAM access drivetrain, it is pretty, like, Wow. Especially if you have one on like, for instance, I don't know, maybe if you have two bikes, you have one on the other bike and it's like, well, okay, I'm not going to have one on one bike and not have it on the other bike. Yeah. Well, that, that was That's what like Liam what was, was saying. talking yeah, about. It's like, okay, yeah. yeah, you have it on one bike and you have to have it on the other bike. Yeah. Because you're going to be pushing norm- that, you're, you're like, oh, yeah. I got to push this paddle? <laughs> this is ridiculous. Yeah. I want a button. Yeah. And yeah, you'll get the button and then it's, everything is amazing. Yeah. That's funny you say that. Cause like Liam was just, so Liam, who's normally on the podcast, he's, he's busy as ever with various other work things, but so we had to skip this one, but he was, yeah, he was saying that he was like talking about getting GX access on back order for himself for some other bike. Cause he has like three bikes and he's like, dude, they're <laughs> You can't just have like two bikes with access no. and not one. I mean, yeah, it's it, this this whole thing sounds very bougie, but like if you live in the bike world, like you spend a lot of your money on nice bike stuff. Um, and yeah, you're right. If you get used to it on one bike, you hop on another bike, and it's like, ah, man, I, I mean, even if you try it, it's like, yeah, oh man, that's like, or it's like when you go to demo a bike and you have a you know 2012 like I don't know. Niner, or Santa Cruz, yeah. or whatever, and you try a 2020 Yeti, and you're like, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. I shouldn't have blowing. done that. Yeah. Because like, now big you can't changes. stop thinking about it. Yep. It's like you try Axis, you're like, okay, wow, that actually was really awesome. Maybe I should get it. Yeah. And I then agree. You're, and then you're rolling and tossing and turning at night thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's more of a you problem. Okay, it's just me. <laughs> Jared has a serious bike part addiction. I shouldn't say anything because I totally do too. <laughs> but it's like, I have other weird problems it's too. Like, it's just, it's like a loop in my head. It's like, okay, yeah, you thought about it. You should get it. Okay. No, maybe I shouldn't. No, yeah, you probably should. I'll think about like tire and wheel setup for till the ends of the earth. It's, well, I'm also yeah. the guy who took a, I want, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted a, basically I wanted the Eagle drivetrain. But where I ride and where I ride mostly on, you know, my shorter travel bike, my Revel Ranger, I don't need a huge gear range. Like I don't need 10 to 50 or 10 to 52. Like I just don't need it. It's just because you're in 
killer shape, dude. I'm in good shape, and uh, I'm not doing rides over like three hours long. Like, I just don't need it. I just would rather have something lighter. I'd rather have my derailleur cage shorter for better just clearance and, again, weight. Yeah. Um, So I'm the guy who was just like a holdout on Eagle, even though I knew it worked great. And then I was like, you know, I really want that gold Eagle cassette. I love gold. I love gold, baby. Like that Austin <laughs> Powers video, gold member. Schmelted. Schmelted gold. And so I was like, I had this idea of like, why don't I take a 12-speed Eagle cassette that's gold and just cut that 50 tooth off? And then I it's take beautiful. And then I'll take the Eagle derailleur and I'll remove the cage from it and I'll put an 11-speed cage on it. So I have the shorter cage and it's, 11 speed and it's 10 to 42 and it's all gold and it's all gold because the only cog that wasn't gold was the big 50 you know that's, <laughs> we literally dreamled that off well i didn't liam did yeah i don't have the skills to do that liam literally dreamled off that yeah it was if you want to see this it's in i made a youtube video about my revel ranger like bike check new bike day type of thing um where we talked more about it and Oh man, we posted a, an Instagram reel got about that. Tons and, of views, and yeah, it got tons of views. I think yeah. like half a million people. Some people got really wow. hot. Oh yeah, people got mad at me. A lot of hot takes Why on there. Why the hell would you do that? Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I mean, ninety percent of the reason there is like, I don't know, I'm just bored. Yeah, like it's just like, what do you, what do you do? Like, because it's know. awesome. Yeah, just like playing around. Like some people totally got it, and other people were just like, what's the purpose of this? Or you yeah. ruined the cassette. And then I had to like backpedal and explain like this is why i did this i didn't ruin the cassette i just removed one gear i'm still using it like i've been using it this whole time had the bike i have like hundreds of miles on that cassette now like i didn't ruin anything (laughs) i did ruin the largest cog modified we we modified it. yeah but you you know what you need to do next is 11 speed axis oh yeah that's that's trickier though because like a mechanical driller you can just lock out the top gear with the limit screws but how do you do that on axis you doesn't can, can you go into the app have, and be like it has only mechanical shift. doesn't it has limit screws doesn't it yeah but you'd still have the the button would still work oh. so it would like jam into the limit screw you would basically just yeah i see what you mean yeah i don't know well we gotta, th- we gotta think about the speed one. shifter no right? i have a i have a 12 speed shifter but it doesn't go like the the limit screw blocks the 12 speed shifter from the final click okay right like it's like you can feel like the shifter's not going because yeah. like the trailer's not going because it's all connected with the cable but Got like it. that doesn't work like that with access okay so sram if so you're listening to... jeff needs 11 speed access on his bike yeah with a 10 to 42 with the 10 to 42 cassette oil slick this time though i want to go oil slick. you want some 11 speed oil slick cassette <laughs> can you please mail it to 3225 grand <laughs> <laughs> thank you <sighs> all right i don't know that was a long tangent but that's what podcasts are for okay next topic and now a word from our sponsors howdy folks my name is bobby and i'm the founder of bobby's bicycle butt butter Our products were created based on the need for a buttery butt because nobody lacks chafe buttocks, and I mean nobody. We have saved thousands of bicycle riding bums with our bicycle butt butter, and you could be next. Visit bobbysbicleballbutter.net and get ready to lather. And now, back to the show. March 2021's Trending Mountain Bike Products. For those of you that don't know, uh, we do a video on trending mountain bike products every single month on YouTube, and it's a lot of fun. We it's, it's we actually do a lot of research on that. It's like a lot of stuff that you know we're selling and seeing you know happening in the industry. But um, a lot of times we're just trying to like actually show everyone what is trending, like what's selling, what people are riding, and a lot of that nowadays kind of has to do with what's in stock, because mm-hmm. that's a bit of an issue, but um, it's always interesting, because different products trend every month in the mountain bike world for various different reasons, and the trending products is based in sales data, not just like, oh, what's cool and new? It's like, oh, no, actually, like, what are people buying? What are people pulling out their wallet for and purchasing, which I always think is kind of cool, which is mm-hmm. why we started the whole series to begin with. Um, so we're going to quickly recap our March YouTube video of trending products via this podcast. Uh, so yeah, what's up, Jared? That's right. What, what was you your got? favorite product? Um, like if you were to go get one right now, <laughs> what would it be? Ah, uh, dude, it's a tough question. Oh, come on. What do you need? I uh, know every biker needs something, even if you already have everything. <laughs> Probably the Asagai, Maxis Asagai tire. I had a feeling. Yeah. Oh, I ran that tire. And although that tire is a bit heavy and a bit slow rolling, 
Oh boy, does it grip the ground like Velcro. Oh, it's grippy. It's I think it's the grippiest tire I've ever ridden. What yeah. about you? It's amazing. You oh yeah, I think so. I'd put it right up there with my Honest favorite opinion, don't tires. lie. We don't lie here. Well, I haven't ridden the other tires in a while. Like What I, other ones? Like a brand new WTB. Yeah. It's so hard. I mean, that's a problem with tires. It's it's a very what the we would call qualitative me. rather than quantitative, which basically means it's really hard to tell. It's up to your opinion, man. It is a little opinionated when it comes to what tires grip. It like, is hard. But so a lot of that then boils back down to like where you're riding, what terrain, how long you've been riding, how that bike you're used to. I don't know. It, Maybe even the compound of that tire. Like you, yeah, yeah. It could one be tire to the next tire. Like compound's one different. DHF could be different from another DHF. True. But like. What's would, hard with tires yeah. too is like a, a general person who's like a general mountain biker that doesn't live in the bike industry every day like we do. Yeah. Like you're going to ride a tire and wear it out entirely and then put a new one on. And if it's a different brand and model, the, just the fact that it's new. Yeah. I mean, it could be a road bike tire for that, for that sake. If it's just new, it's just like, whoa, it grips better. It's way yeah. better than the last one. When it's like, well, not really because you didn't really test it new versus new. Yeah. On the same trail on the same bike. True. It's hard. Yeah. Anyways, the Maxxis Asagai tire was a top selling product. Product. Um, it's been in and out of top selling products for months and months ever since it was released, which is cool. So if you're looking, if you're not concerned about weight and rolling speed per se, but you're really just looking for an extremely grippy tire, yeah, Maxxis Asagai. It's amazing. Yeah, it is cool. Very grippy. Um, yeah, it is very grippy. Okay, so that was one of them. Yes. And now we have. Start from the top. The Park Tool AK5 Toolkit. AK5. AK5. Yeah, Park Tool Toolkits and Park Tool Stands Park tool are big stand. sellers. They've kind of been a big seller for, you know, the last 12 months since a lot of people are at oh, home yeah. more now because I don't know what's going on. Something unprecedented, I was told. But Yeah, I don't know. Um, the details are foggy. We, we, we need not mention it. Let's <laughs> listen to other podcasts if you want to hear about that. Yeah, uh, yeah Park Tool Kits and Park Tool Stands are top. finally starting to trickle back into stock. A lot yes. of them ran out. Oh, they've been uh, out for a while too. Yeah, March, April, May of 2020, basically all Park Tool toolkits and bike stands for your home mechanic work sold out forever, oh, yeah. and now they're finally back. So that's cool. They're not all back, but a lot of them are back. And yeah, Park Tool does a really good job actually, like assembling various like good related bicycle tools that you would need in one toolbox. Oh yeah, um, and it's cool because they it, this is like Park Tool is a bicycle tool company. So when you buy one of their toolkits, you get bicycle specific tools like. Uh, the little Japanese jumping beetle pliers that remove master links, power locks. Um, you get a chain breaker. You get a dummy hub tool. You get a chain whip. You get uh, you know chain cleaner, a cassette brush, spoke wrenches. I mean, stuff that works for modern day bikes, which mm -hmm. is, that's cool. I mean, you're not buying that at Home Depot or Lowe's. Well, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not maybe yeah. harbor freight but probably not no, no definitely dude, not harbor dummy freight hub. doesn't have a dummy no, hub or a chain freight doesn't cleaner have a for a bicycle hub. you're right yeah no you kind of got to go park tool when you're it comes right. to all this although i was using a park tool wrench on my car last night doing what i was removing the intake manifold with a six millimeter park tool wrench P oh, handle. Wow. yeah a six mil allen key yes ah they have allen keys on what do you your rover you yeah. got an allen key on there yeah Huh. It's a six mil. Really? Yeah. Those things are metric, huh? Yeah. It's huh. crazy, right? That's cool. I know. It's weird because like, British people don't use the metric system thought. for the most that's, part. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Different podcasts if you want to hear about <laughs> Range Rovers and Land Rovers <laughs> and all sorts of those problems. Mm, podcast idea. But for the people listening who do like the Rovers, what do you got? Uh, 1995 Range Rover Classic, uh, 25th anniversary edition. With how many miles? 259,000. Isn't that halfway to the moon? <laughs> <laughs> Might be all the way to the moon. Might be all the way to the moon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. The other one was a Park PCS 10.2 home mechanic repair stand, which you actually have in your garage. I do. It's great. Yeah. Love Super it. good stand. Yeah. Park Tool crushes it when it comes to tools and stands and stuff like that. They really do. They do a good job. So if you're looking for home mechanic stuff, there you go. Check out the big blue bike tool company. Yes, sir. Um, Race face Chester handlebars. Yes. An affordable 35 millimeter or 31.8 clamp diameter. Very affordable. Alloy handlebar um, offered in various sizes and widths. And yeah, good very product. affordable. Yeah, that's, Great product. If you're looking for an alloy bar, I mean, that's a killer one and a good price point. Definitely. Next thing up was the Tannis Armor mm -hmm. tubeless tire insert. Yes. Which is a unique one. There's, there's a lot of various tire inserts these days, but Tannis 
as trending like crazy and outselling all the other tire inserts currently. Yeah. Um, yeah, they have a good product. They have a few different ones. They have the tire inserts, and then they have that other one that has, like, the tube. It's a tube armor, kind of, where yeah. you still use a tube, but the uh, insert interfaces directly with the outside of your tire. I guess, well, technically, it would be the inside of your tire. Mm-hmm. And inside so it protects your, your tube. It, it, long story short, it protects your tube. Yeah. Yeah, if you have one in there. Yeah. Well, I guess for that insert, you would need it. Mm, you would for that one. Yes. But they make the other tubeless tire insert, the one that we saw trending a ton in March. Yes. Um, this brand is just trending in general and making really cool, interesting tire stuff. Um, yeah, Tannis, that's a good price. T-A-N-N-U-S. For an yeah, insert. that's the other thing, too, is like that's kind of where they're coming in. They're coming yeah. in with like some good, innovative designs, good materials, and the price point is really good. Um, so, yeah. Better price than Kushcore, a little bit lighter, apparently. Yep. Yeah, Which, you know, interesting. that's what they say. And it comes, it comes folded uh with four looks like it would be for a square and when you pull wheel, it out of the box it looks saying. like it's for a square wheel and then <laughs> just making jokes because in the when we filmed the video we pulled it out and jared's like is this for a square wheel it was it was, it was pretty funny um yeah it looks like it what else we got oh we worldwide got cycle crew socks worldwide cycle plug socks. plug hashtag sponsored um we actually just worked with a company called memory pilot to make actually a really nice high quality lightweight light compression sort of like summer weight sock for hot weather mm-hmm. um worldwide cyclery branded uh, looks sweet cool new design yeah, nice new design, good price point for how quality the socks are. Definitely. Um, pretty solid. Very sweet. We did that with jerseys too. So White Label, mm-hmm. White Label's a, a good friend and customer of ours, Matt Armstrong. He runs that company, and they make custom mountain bike jerseys. We work with them to make um, our own branded Worldwide Cyclery jerseys, and they have, like, just good fabric, cool stuff. He's a good dude. Very cool stuff. Um, we just made a new one. Uh, what, what are we calling it's this called one? called the Classic Jersey. The Classic jersey. Long Sleeve. Yes. That's a pretty creative name. Wasn't as creative as mm. the afternoon delight. Classic jersey. The mm. classic jersey. It's it's pretty subtle. It's pretty subtly branded jersey. Nice materials. Very cool. I liked the afternoon delight. That was that was my favorite. But those yeah. were never jerseys. Those That's were just shirt. t-shirts, right? Yeah. Raymond, I'm looking over at Raymond. He's the guy behind the camera yeah, currently, it's a shirt. and he designs a lot of this stuff, and it's rad. It would be a cool jersey, maybe. Yeah. Can we make an afternoon delight jersey? Um, uh, I don't know. Short. Want a short short sleeve. Yeah. Summertime. Spring. Summertime, baby. Yeah. It'll be done by summer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's always fun making good stuff. We always try to make anything branded worldwide cyclery. I mean, we're we're m- much more than just bike nerds. Um, that's why we also own Kettle Mountain Apparel because we're also apparel nerds. So, like, we make things that have good materials that have good proper fit as well. Um, SRAM Universal Drailer Hanger. Yes. Yes. Cool. Yes, very yeah, cool. that is that's an interesting product, and I'm really happy to see how many of those are selling because the fact that they're selling means they're just on a lot more bikes. So yeah. if you know anything about the bike world, every bicycle has a different trailer hanger. They're completely proprietary, and it's not even just like specific to the brand. It's specific to the model bike. I it's mean, it's ridiculous. Just, it's horrendous. It's ridiculous. It's been like that for I don't know forever, forever. As long as mountain bikes have existed, they've had these unique proprietary trailer hangers. And SRAM is trying to stop that. They're solving that problem. Oh, we were just talking about problems, remember? That is a problem. That is a problem. That's a huge problem. Different derailleur hangers. Different derailleur hangers has always been a huge problem. At one point, so Wheels Manufacturing, um, they make actually a lot of tools, bottom brackets, uh, derailleur hangers, mm-hmm. tons of derailleur hangers. Yep. And they they sent us, I think they sent all bike shops this. It was this massive poster. It was probably three feet by six feet you probably didn't see this because we got this like six years ago okay. they mailed it to the shop i think they mailed it to every bike shop and it was a all it was just drill hangers it was all the trailer it hangers. was drill hangers it was hilarious that and was it was wild. like all the drill hangers they make i mean there was literally probably 500 derailleur hangers on that this insane on this poster and and it was like they all fit different bikes. Wheels Manufacturing, basically, whatever bike you have, Wheels Manufacturing makes a hanger for it. We sell, like, all that Wheels Manufacturing stuff. We pretty much only curate the mountain bike-related stuff. They make mm-hmm. hangers for road bikes and everything else, too, but we just sell the mountain bike versions of it for the most part on our site. But anyways, like, that was a huge issue. Like, every frame was designed around a different derailleur hanger type. Um, it was just a nightmare, the whole complexity thing. Because, like, you break a derailleur hanger, like, you're done. Yeah. You know, like you're probably not getting another one wherever you are. It's just really hard and rare to find hangers. So Stram is trying to solve the problem with a universal derailleur hanger, which basically means if the frame 
is engineered to use this thing, the SRAM mm -hmm. UDH, um, then you use that hanger. And everyone's kind of going to that. And when I say everyone, I mean like bike brands, bike manufacturers, the engineers are designing their bikes to use this SRAM UDH design. Um, so that way there can hopefully be one hanger. There can only be one. There can only be one. I mean, that's that's the hope. That'd be it's, awesome. It's a very well-designed hanger. It has like a break point in it. Like it should work for everything, every mountain bike. I mean, the, the hope is that we just end up with one derailleur hanger for eternity. I right. mean, we have a long ways to go, but this is really cool to see it happening because more and more brands are adopting it and going like, huh, yeah, that's a good idea. We should just do that. Right. It could just eliminate so many headaches, especially if you have a, you know, maybe somewhat obscure bike brand. Like an yep. Uno, like, oh, well, I'm out on a trip in Utah in my trailer hanger book on my Uno. Totally. What the hell are you going to do? Yeah. Like, where are you going to get another well, trailer so hanger? so I brought a Uno? spare one because of that. Yeah. So I had, at, at the time, I went did a Moab trip, Moab, Utah, and I was riding an Uno Dash. Uno is like this extremely high-end boutique, rare Spanish mountain bike brand. And they, of course, have a proprietary trailer <laughs> hanger because yeah. everybody does. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, I need... I, I'm kind of going to U Moab, like <laughs> yeah. just piles and piles of rocks. I'm like, I'm going there with a spare hanger. Yeah. Um, I didn't break a hanger. I've never broke, I haven't broken a hanger in quite some time, but I took one with me because like, gee, you, you have a, a rare bike and you go to a place like that and you break a hanger, like your, your trip's gone. It's Smart. Done. It's done. So I, I always bring a spare, but I've been like traveling for mountain bike races for a decade that I like made sure to have spare yeah. hangers. But yeah, anyways, it's a even, cool problem to see being solved. Even like a not so rare bike, like a Yeti, like, yeah, what do you got? You got to go find a Yeti dealer. Yeah. Like that's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in the middle of nowhere, it's like, Oh, I got to look up the closest Yeti dealer to get a derailleur hanger. That's yeah. crazy. That is crazy. So SRAM UDH, awesome to see it trending, which just means that more and more bike brands are adopting this concept of a universal derailleur hanger that fits on everything. Very cool. Could take another 10 years to be fully implemented, but <laughs> we're, we're making headway. Yes, we are. Uh, least but not last. Least but not last. As we say, uh, the SRAM rear derailleur chain gap adjustment guide. Yes, sir. Which is a, what, a $9 little tool that helps you adjust your SRAM Eagle derailleur. Mm -hmm. um, it works for the 10 to 50 or the 10 to 52 Eagle cassettes. And it's basically, I mean... The B tension on derailleurs, now that there are these big 12 speed high range cassettes, like it's just really important. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything in the mountain bike world is really important to adjust properly, but especially when it comes to these like wide range cassettes, you really got to set your B tension and your chain length correctly. Mm -hmm. This little $9 tool, it does it. It's helpful. Yeah, that's that. It's a huge yeah. part of it. It's a huge part of it. It's an effortless way to adjust your derailleur. I wouldn't call it effortless because oh, you still have to put in some effort to do it. It is a very easy way. Minimal effort way. Minimal effort. It's a minimal effort yes, way. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, that's, that, I mean, people are buying that because they're working on their Stram Eagle drivetrains at home. And yeah, it's cool. That's right. I like that. All right, let's jump into the next one. Tires that are not Maxis. What? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how we actually came up with this idea and made it into a, a lengthy blog article as well as a YouTube video, but... I don't know. A lot of people ask, right? I mean, yeah. we, we talk about tires. So I mean, tires are a big topic in the mountain bike world. We talk about Maxxis a ton. We've written tons of articles about them on our site to help educate people and help get them through the decision paralysis of like, OMG, I've got so many choices. What do I buy? Um, we've made a lot of videos on it too. And then we just, you know, the, a lot of our people don't, not everyone wants Maxxis. Not everyone wants that flavor. Although Maxxis, my estimation is that they have 85% market share. Wow. That's my guess. I mean, I have no idea. I don't know if anyone knows, right? I'm going to agree. Yeah. And, and I mean, like in the high end mountain bike space, not like all bikes, right. obviously. They're not, they're not, you don't see Maxxis tires on like bikes under a thousand bucks or right. toy store bikes, whatever. Yeah. But so a lot of people like other brands. And there actually is a lot of other competitive, smaller, more boutique brands that are not quite as large as Maxxis um, making really good mountain bike tires. And so we went over several of them in this video and we're going to blitz through them right now via this podcast. Number one, Terravail. Mm -hmm. You've run some Terravails, right? I have. Yeah. I've ran the Kessel. That's probably my favorite one from Terravail for mountain bike. Uh, I believe it was the durable. They have a durable and ultra durable casing. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I really like that tire. Good grip, pretty predictable in terms of the traction and fast rolling too for what it is and i would definitely run a kessel again in the future yeah yeah, yeah. really Ter like those caravel yeah um 
T E R A V A I L. Black and tan wall. Yeah, their tan wall looks good too. It's like it a does. darker tan. It's like way nicer than yeah. a lot of the other tan walls yeah, out there. It's, it's very nice. I like the um, Terrible tires. Yeah, they have like good mountain bike setup. I think they, they have like a really well known gravel tire too. Several of them. I'm not as versed in the gravel side mm-hmm. of things, but their they do. their Kessel and their A line are their more common and the Honcho are their more common mountain bike tires, which are cool. Yeah, those are great. So yeah, that was in there. Michelin. Michelin. I personally have not run any Michelin, but I've heard really good things. I ran some of their tires once and the rubber was incredible. Nice. I ran like their Wild AMs, I think. This was before the Wild Enduro was a thing. This yeah. was several years ago. Um, but yeah, Michelin is is just. I think. A, I mean, it's a massive company. I think. I think it's the biggest tire company. I think in the world. I think in the world, Michelin's the biggest tire company because they make tires you. for like airplanes and cars and I mean every possible thing that uses a tire. Um, I think I read that them or BFG, BF Goodrich. But anyways, yeah, this seems like they have a pretty diverse array of yeah. You know, it's like one of those things. that's like everyone knows Michelin. Yeah, like every human on the earth knows the Michelin. And man. They've been around for like, like what, like over a hundred years, or something like that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, but their mountain bike tires are really. Uh, gaining, gaining some traction, oh, dad yeah. joke. Do you like that? Uh, nice. And a lot of that is because they sponsored Sam Hill, right? So Sam Hill is one of the most all time winningest downhill racers mm-hmm. turned enduro racer, um, Australian dude. I used to like idolize the guy as a kid cause he was just this unbelievably fast mountain biker yeah and he, he's so good so talented and he's famous for his cornering skills flat he's pedals and medals yeah and he rides flat pedals that's yeah. nothing he's famous for mm-hmm. um but he's been riding michelin tires for i don't know how long a few years now at least racing ews's maybe five years mm-hmm. um michelin wild enduro and then he's using that and he's also using their dh22 nice um yeah, so I mean, Michelin, they're they're really hard. They're just harder to come by yeah. in the U.S. Like they're not as commonly stocked amongst the bike shops yeah. and available. Hard to get right um, now. They're super hard to get. Their inventory is like terrible this year because they what they did bring over here sold out. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe they're doing more like OEM stuff, so maybe more of their, you know. Uh, supplies going towards those applications Could be that. instead of the aftermarket. Yeah. yeah, it's tough to say. I mean, all these brands are in their own battle against supply chain issues because of everything that yeah. the pandemic's caused. But it's wild. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it is wild. Wild, wild oh, AM. Wild yes. AM is their all we mountain tire. That is, that is good. Thank you. Um, I don't know. So, yeah, we're just going to run, yeah, continue running through these other brands that, that aren't Maxis. Mm-hmm. Schwalbe. Schwalbe mm-hmm. is like, come on. Oh, you know what? So many people commented and were like, Totally infuriated. It's like, I hate how Americans say Schwalbe. Well, how do you say it? I don't know. Schwalbe? Schwalbe. Schwalbe. I don't know, dude. It's a, it's a German company, right? All these people commented on that YouTube video really? and were just like, I can't believe Americans say Schwalbe like that. If you're listening like, and you think we're saying it wrong, just let dude, us know. Dude, go read the YouTube comments. Okay. <laughs> There's like 100 people from <laughs> Europe that in Germany or wherever that were just like making fun of us. And it's like, well, everyone here, sorry. Everybody says Schwalbe here. Everyone here in a good old USA calls it Schwalbe. Schwalbe. Maybe it's that. Schwalbe. Schwalbe. I, I have no idea. Whatever, Regardless, dude. the Magic Come Mary on. is a great tire. I've run yeah, that in the past. Yeah, they make good tires. Yeah. Um, That's what I was going to say before is the only tire that I could think, or a couple tires that I could think of that hold a candle to the Asagai is a Magic Mary and uh, WTB Vigilante Vigilante or the Vigilante Vigilante I don't know how to say that word those are One both of those. great tires but yeah they, they are uh, yeah, yeah so Magic these, Mary is great Magic Mary is good that's like a really aggressive sort of like yeah. downhillish heavy enduro tire then they also make the Noppy Nick for more trail stuff the Hans yeah. Domp is yep. kind of like a very famous tire from them um, yeah it's all good those, stuff those are all really good it's like when you get a new Magic Mary on the bike and you get the dirt flying up and hitting you in the face. It's like how mm-hmm. sticky the rubber is. It's like, <laughs> ah, yes. It's a sticky tire. Uh, I like it. The, the things mountain bikers get really excited about. <laughs> Brand new tire rubber. Fresh rubber. Throwing dirt into your face. There's nothing like fresh rubber. There's nothing like fresh rubber. That's right. Um, Continental. Continental. This is a German brand, right? The Deutsche. German. That's right. From the Deutschland. The yeah, I don't know. That was another thing that like people were mentioning. I think we said... Which one do we pronounce wrong? The Der Kaiser. Oh, what? I mean, yeah, I think I think it's pronounced differently than oh, Der Kaiser. Yeah. 
In American, it's pronounced Der Kaiser. <laughs> Der Kaiser. I don't know. That That's one of their Continental's popular tires. They're actually made in Germany. Like, almost all their tires are made in Germany, which is cool. Like, that's awesome. Not many brands are made anywhere other than Asia. Um, their Mountain King's popular. Their Trail King's popular. Continental's got definitely a good following. Um, much more so, of course, in, in Europe. They're not quite as prominent in the USA. Uh, WGB. No, that WGB. is a USA brand. And WGB has been, man, they've been... I think they've been around longer than we've been around. This is a brand. They've been making tires and forever. They grips even made a bike back in the day. Rims. They made a bike. Yeah. Really? I didn't yes. Know that. Yeah. WTB is like an iconic, historic mountain bike brand, which is pretty cool. From California, I think originally or Colorado. I know they're in. I know they're all the Northern, guys we talk to now Northern are in Northern California. California. I don't know where they're from yeah. originally, but. Um, yeah, they make good stuff. The Vigilante, 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 Vigilante. and the Trail Boss. The Trail Boss, great yep, tire. That's Love a good the one. Vigilante um, up front, Trail Boss, and the, the rear. Judge. The Judge is Ooh. pretty, pretty gnarly. They're always coming out with new tires too. I think we missed a couple popular models that they came out with that were new. Yeah. Um, they make some really good gravel tires too. You love their gravel they tires. They do. Yeah, that's what I ride. I ride their Resolutes on my gravel bike. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, a hammer on those tires, and they are the only ones that I've found that survive basically my non-gravel bike. It's <laughs> it's a gravel bike, but I put flat bars on it and drop a post, and I ride it like a mountain bike. Your because, riding style. Yeah, yeah, which is inappropriate for what it's meant to be, but <laughs> for what gravel bike, I don't know. I can't ride drop bars. I'm, no. I'm too far down the mountain bike path there. That's, use those. No. Uh, You're correct, sir. Vittoria. Vittoria. Italian brand. Um, they're, they're actually, so we like looked them up for this video because they do have some small presence in the U.S. And looking them up, they make a huge amount of tires mm -hmm. um, for all sorts of bikes, which is cool. And, yeah, you don't see them often, but they make some really competitive tires when it comes to high-end mountain bike stuff with yeah. good tread patterns, good weight, uh, good weight to width and size ratios. Um, yeah, they make good stuff. The Maza, the Martello, and the Garo, uh, and the Mota. Oof. That's their popular mountain bike ones. I like I it. may have botched all those names, but that's Mota. close enough. Uh, then E13. E13 is another brand that's like they've been making interesting mountain bike components for a very long time. Yeah. And they make some tires as well. They're one of the few brands that have solved this. And I guess it's because they make wheels too. Mm -hmm. um, they solved the whole issue of like your tire logos lining up nicely with your rim logos. Yes. Um, <laughs> that's, that's something either. I mean, that's a weird thing to say. That's like a feature, but it actually <laughs> looks really good. Like their graphic design on the rim and the tire. If you use their wheels or their oh, yeah. rims and their tires, like it looks it amazing. Looks awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It looks way better. It just, it looks like they're made to pair together, which they are. And it looks really good. So well, they're also probably one of the few companies that makes rims and slash wheels and tires. Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's how they can pull it off, but it yeah. looks good. Yeah. And they have that like bead technology too, to make it easier to bead. Um, yeah, it's cool stuff. I mean, those, those are a handful of brands that are not Maxxis that also make really good high end mountain bike tires. And obviously we mentioned that we, in the video, we kind of, for some reason, neglected Kenda. Kenda has like, Kenda used to be a really big, good competitive tire company. And then they like disappeared for a decade and made garbage. And then they came back and yeah. now they're like kind of back and make good stuff and clearly still have a following. There was like a dozen comments of people saying like, you idiots, you forgot Kenda. <laughs> um, sorry. Yes, sorry. We, we did. Like we just never see them. Like when was the last time you saw Kenda in the shop? Oh man. Almost never. Yeah, it's, it's very rare. It's just yeah. not, I mean, yes, there's a following. It's still a prominent brand, but, like, you just don't see them. Yeah. I don't know anybody that rides those. Except like, for yes, Aaron Glenn. Does he even ride them now, though? He changes, like, every six months the guy's on oh, some new tires. I thought he. He was on Onza. That was another brand we didn't put in there. Onza oh, makes some cool stuff. Yeah. But he's not on Onza. Maybe he went from Onza to Kenda. I don't know. I, I mean, think I think he's on Kenda right now. Kenda and Onza pay some money, pay some big bucks to have some professional athletes use their stuff. But yeah. does that mean they make good tires? Does it mean they just pay people to ride them? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't tested all of them, but make the decision for yourself. Yeah. Um, Bontrager and Specialized, we put that in the video too. Obviously, Bontrager is Trek's house brand. Um, they make a bunch of nice stuff as well for tires. And so does Specialized. Specialized makes good tires. I mean, I mentioned in the video that like, I don't, I personally like, I just like a, a, it's a personal thing here, but like I would never run like a Trek House brand Bontrager tire on any bike other than a Trek. 
And I would never run a specialized tire on any bike other than a specialized. I don't think it's I just don't. You. It's just not. It's no. just not. It's not cool. If you don't want to be a squid and get made fun of, don't do that. That's like putting BMW wheels on a Mercedes. That's exactly my thought. Right. It's just you just don't do that. You don't do that. No. Like unless you want to get made fun of. <laughs> and you very much so well. Yeah, so <laughs> I don't know. Some people might be like, "Oh, you guys are jerks." Like I'll put those on any other bike, whatever. Like, but it's like, it's just, I mean, it's, it's our like opinion, man. Those tires come stock on that bike because mm -hmm. they make them. Like, well, yeah, I'm not gonna go get them just because I don't know. But you're right. It's a weird thing to seek out. Like, if you have all these yeah. options, why would you go get totally. an OEM tire from a big brand? Yep. But if you do have a Trek or a Specialized. They do make some good tires. And typically, like, you see, like, so there's a lot. Obviously, Trek and Specialized have the most amount of bike shops around the country. Mm -hmm. Trek dealers, Specialized dealers, they always carry the Bontrager and, and the Specialized tires. Um, and, yeah, they're good options. So, like, if you have a Trek or you have a Specialized, like, those are totally good options to consider. You know, and if you're not like us and you don't care about that whole, you know, weenie thing we're talking about there, just put them on whatever bike you want if you want to ride them. Yeah. Um, just don't listen to us right there. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's your tires, not Maxis. That's right. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. If you like tires, let's jump into a couple quick listener questions around brake problems and Fox suspension. Yes, please. Don't read that whole first question. It's really lengthy. Just, okay. just give us the synopsis of that <clears throat> first question. Okay. This listener has SRAM G2R brakes that are just a few months old, but... They are making some noise and they're not working to their full potential. He is wondering how to get them back to full potential. Yeah. So my thought with brakes, this this is the common mistake I've seen so many people make over the years, is they don't do the brake in process correctly. Ah. And I don't blame them because it doesn't really say it anywhere where to do it. Like I don't think it says it on the box or mm -hmm. in the maybe it says it in the instructions nobody reads those come no. on we're men we don't read instructions no um breaking in your brakes is so important and the the typical method to do it is when you get brand new brakes whether that's entirely new new brakes new pads new rotors or just one of them mm -hmm. um the way you want to break everything in is pedal up to speed about let's say 15 to 20 miles an hour like crank it up there and then slowly grab those brakes and like gently come to, come to a roll not a complete stop you don't want to lock them up come to a roll and let go and then do the same thing again five times mm -hmm. take a break you'll be out of breath at this point do it again five times take a break do it again five times like that's it and that seems very you're probably like oh i didn't know that i don't know a lot of people i've told that it's like oh i didn't know that because the break in process can totally determine how those pads mesh in with the rotors. And then that really makes a huge difference in how those brakes work from there on out. Um, this is given the fact, like, we're, we're assuming your brakes are bled perfectly, mm -hmm. which is not always easy. That's to what do. I was going to say is maybe yeah. he needs to go and do just like a very nice thorough True. bleed. Yep. And that's another like common problem. That, yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes people install their own brakes and they don't know how to bleed them correctly. Right. Ooh, or even yeah, it's, it's a hard know, product it's been a few months for this guy and that could very well be just the thing he needs mm -hmm. maybe they weren't bled properly from the start um and also he says he cleans his rotors and he sanded his pads but maybe he's just not bedding them in properly after he does that like yeah. you said like he should yeah, just go cleaning, through that process yeah because that's the other thing like brake pads especially are, are highly absorbent so like an aerosol like there's a reason Bicycle chain loop doesn't come in aerosol cans. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because brake pads are so absorbent and they're so gentle that, like, if they even just wince at a aerosol lube, Oof. it just, like, sucks it up and your brakes are ruined. Forget if it. you get fluid on them when you're bleeding them, like, they're ruined. If mm -hmm. you put the wrong kind of cleaning solvent on there and it oversprays when you're spraying it on your cassette as a degreaser and it hits your brake pads, like, eh, ruined. Mm -hmm. Um so they're so sensitive, yeah. so sensitive. I mean, when I worked in a, a local shop where we had just like tons of foot traffic, um, people would come in all day with contaminated brake pads. And they're wow. like, these things are how howling and they don't work. And like, they were always really upset because I was like, dude, like you just ruined the pads. Yeah. Like, I or like using WD-40 for your chain lube. Ugh, like yeah. I had a neighbor yeah, the other day ask like me, hey, can I use WD-40 on my chain? I'm like, eh, you, you probably shouldn't. Here's some chain lube you could borrow. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, that'll easily spray in WD-40 on your chain. That'll easily get on your pads and your brakes are ruined. Totally. Um, yeah. But yeah, if that stuff doesn't fix uh, this listener's brakes, I would say maybe evaluate what compound you have. 
if you're using a centered compound and you don't need that power, maybe try an organic compound. Yeah. It'll we help out your We have a YouTube your video noise. and article on that topic. We do. Mm -hmm. There you go. Learn some um, mountain bike things. So yeah, maybe do a little bit of experimenting. Maybe try a different pad compound. Um, you know, maybe a different rotor if you want. Yeah. Yeah, brakes are complicated. I mean, they need to be totally clean. They yeah. can't be contaminated. They need to be broken in properly. They need to be bled perfectly. Yeah. Um, you need to have the size rotors that match sort of your bike and your weight and all, all that sort of stuff and, and your riding style. Yep. Um, bigger rotors have more power and are more necessary. The faster you're going and the steeper things you're going down and the heavier you are. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, brakes are a little tricky. Yeah. They're, they're I a little think complicated. Given but, enough information yeah. for this listener to be dangerous. Yeah, there yeah. we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> perfect. Definitely. Hopefully, hopefully we taught someone something that's I think listening. so. A lot um, of stuff goes into it. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, it really does. All right. The next question, is Fox Factory worth it over performance or performance elite? So that's a complicated question. So Fox Factory is like their premium level suspension. Yep. It's got the Kashima stanchions. Yep. That's like kind of looks gold, but the it's best, called Kashima. The best damper possible, the typically. The best damper. Yep. Um, and the Kashima Sanctions. And the Kashima so Sanctions. Then, so then, like, the Performance Elite, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, like, identical other than that it has black stanchions. So it Pretty just much. lacks Kashima, but it still uses the same dampers and everything else. Right, like, if you were to get a Fox 38 Performance Elite, it would have a Grip 2 damper, same as the factory, mm -hmm. um, same air spring, same lowers, just black stanchions yep. instead of factory or, yeah, instead of Kashima. Yep. So is it better or is Well, and then performance, right? Yeah. Performance is yet another right. tier lower. Performance, and performance will, yeah. is a different category because it like has like damper. totally different dampers and yeah. air springs sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. It could be, yeah, it's typically probably a grip damper with a, like just a compression knob, you know, no real like set positions or mm -hmm. like high speed, low speed compression adjustments. It's typically just a compression adjustment. Um, so, yeah, what do you say? Is factory worth it over performance or performance elite? I mean, me personally, I actually like and prefer the look of the black stanchion. So, mm -hmm. like, the last bike I rode with Fox suspension was my Yeti SB 4.5, and I had a performance elite 34 on there and a performance elite uh, DPS rear shock. That, a, that look bike was a looker. It looked good. If you haven't seen this yeah. bike, you should you should do yourself a favor and Just look it up. in, like, Worldwide Cycler Yeti SB 4.5 and... You'll see me talking about the yeah. thing. Um, it looked cool. And I custom painted the fork lowers turquoise. It was the coolest 4.5. Um, yeah, I like that thing, man. I really love that bike. That was such a good bike. I don't yeah. know who has it now, but hopefully he's stoked. I yeah. know he was stoked when I sold it to him. It was sweet. Um, yeah, that was cool. So, I don't know. I mean, Kashima, in my opinion, and right, this is where, like, oh, you're biased because you own a bike shop. But it's like, I'm actually going to go the other way here. Like, I don't think so. Yeah. Like, I think it's negligible. Like, I don't think anyone on the planet could tell a difference between Performance Elite versus Kashima if they were blindfolded, which yep. is not really possible to do because you can't really ride a mountain bike blindfolded. But I just don't, like, I get Fox's sort of, I don't know if they have claims, but they kind of say that Kashima's, like, slicker, mm -hmm. right? Like, on the seals. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, With less friction. <laughs> I mean, I totally... I think it's negligible. I don't think it's, I don't think it's worth the extra money. But then again, like... It looks expensive it looks and it amazing. looks rad yeah, it looks and it's great. like that Kashima stanchion is unique to Fox and yeah. it looks gorgeous. So like there is a cachet that comes along with Kashima that you can't get with Performance Elite, period, yeah. end of story. Yeah. Maybe the performance is the same, but the cachet, it ain't there, brother. That's right. It just has so. that je ne sais quoi. <laughs> the creme de la the creme because creme creme. that's what they call fox factory right the yeah. fox factory is the creme de la creme it's like what their factory professional racers are using um it's the best of the best right like yeah. they're not look they're not like sitting there going oh negligible gains they're going like no let's look at like microscopic <laughs> gains because yeah. like we're fox and we're trying to win races and trying to build the best suspension in the world yeah so like that's where kashima is and if you want that that's kashima totally you know if you don't want to pay the price then like don't just get performance elite it's got the same damper yeah everything's the same just i know got a black stanchion yeah so transfer post fox transfer post same thing it's like yeah. 50 bucks just yeah. for kashima transfer post versus performance elite yeah but it matches your kashima shock and fork if you have one yes it does so yeah i mean i don't think jared's ever have you ever read performance elite you're always just kashima i've had performance elite have you I don't know, man. All the bikes I, I see don't with think you, I you don't. <laughs> no. Yeah, you um, you love the cachet. A lot of people do. People love the cachet of Kashima. It's the creme de la creme. It's the top end. Like, 
there's there's yeah. some bougie that I comes mean, with Kashima that I, you just can't get without factory series. I, I say, yeah, if you're performance elite, performance, negligible difference. You've got the same damper, the same internals, uh, the coating. You can't tell me the coating is going to make the perf- like. I mean, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, yes, it looks amazing, and maybe that's all you need to make you faster is the Kashima coating. <laughs> yeah. And to, you look good, you feel good, you ride good. Like, that is it, right? Yeah. Um, so... Is it worth it? It's all what matters to you. Yeah, totally. I don't know. The good news is that we're so deep into this podcast that only bike snobs are listening at this point, like true bike nerds. So like they can relate to this. Whereas if this was like earlier in the podcast, there'd be a lot of people like, these guys are bike snobs. And it's like, well, I'm kind of our bike snobs. Like, I'm not going to say I'm not. Um, yeah. We've just been in the industry for too long and we ride nice bikes and like we just live and breathe this stuff every day. So it's, yeah. it's a very different mentality. Um, than people who don't work in the bike industry. But yeah. anyways, all right, that's that. Fox Factory, good stuff. It's that's good. all we got. That's all we got for you. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening. We love you. Thank you very much. Tell I love you, you love too. Them. Yeah. Tell them you love them. I love them. And, I love you and guys. And send us fan mail to yes. our California store, uh, 3225 Grande Vista Drive, Newbury Park, California, 91320. We love fan mail. We're hanging it up on the wall in this one spot. It's hilarious, the fact that people send us fan <laughs> I mail. I love it, yeah. We've got a couple pieces of fan mail. We're a very it. humorous bunch of people in the whole company, and our YouTube videos are really based around humor, so a lot of people send us funny fan mail, and like we like that. It's funny. It makes, it's awesome. It makes everyone laugh. Yes, it does. Um, sometimes creeps us out, depending on what gets sent. <laughs> So far, so far, nothing too creepy. Nothing too come creepy. Through. No. Definitely some comments, but you yeah, know, we love it. We love the fan mail. We appreciate you guys listening, and it means a lot to us. Yeah, thank you very much for the support and listening this long. Rock on, go ride your bike. See you next time. Yes, sir. Cool to live. Happy trails.